Well, good afternoon. I'm Denver Police Chief uh, Ron Thomas, and uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, today, I'm going to provide uh, an updated briefing. We'll also be releasing some body cam video uh, in relation to an officer-involved shooting incident that occurred May 1st in the 2000 block of Oneida Street. Um, uh, during the briefing, we will describe how uh, Denver police officers responded to an incident and tried to peacefully resolve that incident, but ultimately felt compelled to use force in order to uh, uh, protect two people that they believe to be in imminent danger of being seriously injured or killed. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to, to uh, Commander Matt Clark. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Matt Clark, the commander of the Major Crimes Division for the Denver Police Department. Appreciate you being here and giving us an opportunity to provide an overview uh, related to a police officer involved uh, shooting incident that occurred on Monday, May 1st, 2023, around 8.30 p.m. at 2045 North Oneida Street in Northeast Denver. This briefing is intended to provide preliminary information based on details we've gathered through interviewing witnesses, speaking with the involved officers, and analyzing evidence collected from the scene. This investigation is in the early stages, and there may be information I do not have at this point, uh, which may limit my ability to answer some questions, but to the degree that we are able, we'll answer any questions at the conclusion. On Monday, May 1st, 2023, around 8.30 p.m., Denver police officers were called to 2045 Oneida Street on a report of a family disturbance with weapons. The 911 caller reported that her nephew was inside the residence and was threatening uh, other people inside with a knife. The 911 caller told the call taker that her nephew was attempting to stab someone and further reported that he had used narcotics earlier. Officers arrived to this priority call within three minutes of the call being made. When they arrived, the officers observed the complainant standing outside of the residence, still, commuting with, still communicating with the 911 call taker. The officers directed her to a location that was away from the residence so it was safe to have a conversation with her, and they confirmed the information that she previously could provided to the call taker specifically uh, that her nephew was in the residence with two other people and that he was armed with a knife. Based upon concerns for the safety of the other occupants in the residence uh, with the armed subject there, the officers approached the residence and made entry, uh, unlocking the door using a key that was provided by the complainant. Upon opening the door, the uniform officers verbally called out to the armed subject and identified themselves as Denver police officers. The officers entered the residence uh, and observed a male looking outside of a bedroom door. The bedroom door was quickly shut and the officers immediately uh, heard a male yelling, I have hostages. This was stated several times. The officers did not rush into the room but instead took positions at the end of a hallway as they worked to communicate with the subject and determine the status and condition of the other occupants of the room. The officers requested additional patrol officers to respond and directed EMS and fire personnel to stage in the area. A reverse 911 notification was issued to neighboring residents in the immediate area as well. For the next 57 minutes, officers communicated with the subject and the two individuals being held hostage from down the hall and through the bedroom door. The officers received verbal confirmation directly from the two hostages that they were not physically injured. The officers then focused their communication efforts on the subject, working to understand the situation and resolve the situation peacefully. As the conversation with the subject continued, the officers recognized uh, the value of having additional tactical and negotiation resources at the scene, so the situation was declared to be a barricade. The declaration of a barricade situation activates the tactical resources of the Metro SWAT team, the Special Operations Response Team, as well as the negotiators with the department's crisis negotiation team. Throughout the interaction, the subject sounded agitated and was often yelling while speaking. At times, he appeared to be yelling at the two individuals he was holding in the room. While additional resources were responding to assist, one of the department's mental health clinician co-responders who was assigned to District 2 patrol arrived at the scene. The mental health clinician began communicating with the subject from inside the residence at the same location that the officers were. The subject indicated he did not want to communicate with the clinician any longer, but instead wanted to continue communication with the officers that were previously talking to him. Officers resumed the primary uh, communication role with the subject at that point. After nearly an hour of negotiation efforts, officers recognized a commotion occurring inside the room. Specifically, they heard what sounded like a struggle and heard the female repeatedly yelling, stop. The officers believed the two being held in the room needed immediate assistance, and they forced their way into the bedroom by kicking the door open. 
Once inside, the officers recognized a violent struggle was occurring on the ground between the subject who was armed with a knife and the male victim. Uh, the uniformed officers gave verbal commands to drop the knife while advancing towards the subject. The officers recognized the male victim was attempting to hold or push the arm of the armed subject away from him to avoid being stabbed. The officers described they felt the male victim was in jeopardy of being seriously injured or killed by the subject with a knife. At that point, two Denver police officers discharged their weapons, striking the subject multiple times. This stopped the subject's assault of the male. Both victims were immediately removed from the room and evaluated by medical personnel. The male, was trans the male victim was transported to the hospital and was treated for a stab wound to his chest. He has since been released from the hospital and is expected to recover. Paramedics promptly uh, assessed the subject who was shot by officers and that person was uh, determined to be deceased at the scene. The investigation of this critical incident is being conducted by the Colorado Bureau of Investigations, the Colorado State Patrol, the Denver Police Department's Homicide Unit, and the Denver District Attorney's Office. It's being overseen and monitored by the Office of the Independent Monitor, which is a civilian oversight entity. Through the investigation, it was determined that a combined total of five rounds were fired by the two Denver police officers. Crime scene technicians documented and recovered the knife that the subject possessed and used to assault the male victim. During interviews with the two victims, it was learned that the male was continuously holding the knife while he was in the room and at times was physically present preventing them from leaving the room. <clears throat> uh, just prior to the officers entering the room, uh, investigators learned that the male victim attempted to disarm the subject who was holding a knife uh, and the struggle ensued over that knife. And this appears to be the commotion that the officers heard from down the hall and the events that caused the female to begin yelling stop repeatedly. The conflict that led to the initial 911 call in this incident and subsequent hostage situation appears to have escalated from an allegation uh, related to a previously unreported assault between the male and female victims. A subsequent investigation is being conducted in regards to the assault allegation to determine if charges are warranted in that case. The subject has been identified as 55-year-old Frankie Lee Evans. Date of birth is November 4th of 1967. The officers who discharged their weapon during this incident are uniformed officers assigned to the patrol division in District 2. One of the officers is a sergeant who's been with the department since 2013, and the other is a patrol officer who's been with the department since 2019. Neither officer has been involved in a prior police shooting incident. Both officers were equipped with body-worn cameras, and they had their cameras activated in, uh, during the incident, and the incident was captured on their cameras. Uh, the individual, excuse me, the involved officers are currently on a modified duty assignment uh, as they process through the department's reintegration program. I understand body-worn camera, uh, we've released at this point one of the office, involved officers' body-worn cameras. Uh, portions of that audio were redacted. I'll just uh, describe that that was for the privacy interests of the victims as well as to protect medical information that was contained within. I can answer any questions or myself or the chief. Were the officers who discharged their weapons the same ones that, that he had asked to communicate with? Yes, sir. And, um, do, you know the, do you know this man's relationship to the two victims? Uh, he would have been, he was uh, the nephew of the male victim and had no familiar relation to the female. Okay. Had there been prior calls to service at that address? You know? There were prior calls for service. Uh, the Denver Police Department um, met with uh, Mr. Evans previously on April 14th on another incident. Um, and um, did, and you mentioned that the, the, the caller was, um, was the aunt of, of this man? That's correct. Okay, um, and did both her and then the, the male victim who was his, um, who was his nephew, I believe, um, did they both live at this residence? Uh, I know that the residents belong to the 911 caller. I'm not sure of the exact status. Um, real briefly, I can just put some context and, and highlight some of the uh, perspectives of the officers as well as uh, what they saw once they entered the room. Uh, I think it's important to, to, to look at a timeline as well as we go through uh, to see exactly how this call transpired and the efforts of the officers uh, throughout. So again, uh, the call was immediately dispatched, as you can tell. Within three minutes of the call being made, our first officers on scene and having conversations, getting information from the complainant there. Uh, they recognized the situation uh, and the need for medical personnel to stage in the area, and that was immediately done. 
a reverse 911 notification to the uh, area residents for a shelter in place was immediately completed to let them know uh, of the police action in the area. The barricade situation being declared activated our tactical and, and negotiation resources to respond to the scene. The co-responder who was working in the patrol division uh, with, along with a District 2 officer arrived and was an active part of the uh, efforts to safely resolve this. And then even once the subject uh, indicated he wanted to speak with officers, the co-responder stayed and continued to provide assistance uh, and, and direction to the officers to help resolve the incident. Uh, approximately now an hour and two minutes after the initial call, the officers have been negotiating for nearly 57 minutes. Um, they hear the disturbance. They feel at that point that they need to go in uh, and rescue the two individuals, and that's when the shots are fired. Questions on the timeline before I move on? Uh, this is the perspective. This is a crime scene photo looking uh, what the officers would have seen when they came in the residence. Uh, this is ultimately, you'll see from the next slide where they stand. The room is the, the closed door on the left. This is a body a screenshot of a body camera from one of the involved officers. Uh, this is the location where he was communicating and they were uh, through that door there at the end of the hall. When the officers uh, make entry into this room, it's a small room. Uh, it is, there are three individuals there. So there is a uh, female back here. The male is, uh, our male offender uh, subject is uh, towards the wall. And then you have our male victim in the red. He's got a knife in a downhill. He's pointing and trying to push it down while you can see the male appears to be holding his arm up, preventing him from stabbing him. Another uh, screenshot from the same officer's body camera. Again, the knife's a little clearer there. The victim's arm doesn't have any uh, clothing or a shirt on. It's the plain arm holding the other guy. And that, uh, again, is just another, he continues to hold that arm up and prevent that knife from coming down and stabbing him. This is a photograph of the knife, a crime scene photo that was recovered by the crime scene technicians. Any other questions? normal or part of the procedure dealing with a subject who's barricaded themselves and they don't want to talk to the negotiator and they want to talk to a different officer is that do the, do the, does the sergeant and the patrol officer do they get trained to do that stuff they do uh so obviously just interacting part of all of our training encompasses de-escalation tactics techniques crisis intervention training tactics techniques to to resolve and to, to communicate with people ultimately uh the the clinician the co-responder yielded back to the officers because it the the conversation continued to occur between the two so uh it was determined that was the best course of action at the time um and those handoffs can occur based on the rapport that's been built, based on the response of the, of the individual that we're interacting with. Is it standard um, for a clinician to respond to um, standoff situations? That varies based on the scenario. Um, a lot of times involving weapons, they're, they're not the primary responders, the officers are, but in this uh, scenario, the officers felt it was appropriate um, and that the clinician uh, could have yielded um, some assistance to them or offered them assistance in this. Um, and and did, did the man directly kind of state why he did not want to talk to the clinician? Um, I don't recall specifically if he, if he made comments. Um, can you talk any more um, just about the, the modified duty that those two officers are on? So following a critical incident, uh, the, uh, the department has a, a robust reintegration process that is uh, officer-centric, wellness-based. Uh, it allows the officer to take a tactical pause, uh, to go through a, a process to, um, to process the trauma, the life-threatening trauma, the use of deadly physical force. Um, it allows the officer and the department to uh, just slowly navigate through a process um, of, of varying scenarios. They'll be reintegrated through um, shoot, don't shoot scenarios in a virtual environment. They'll do live fire scenarios at the range um, and just make sure that when they are ready to come back to patrol, um, they, are, they can transition back smoothly. Um, and and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm not understanding right, but I thought normally the protocol after um, when an officer shoots somebody was to put them on administrative leave. 
um, at least until a, any kind of criminal investigation um, into the shooting is, is concluded. Um, can you talk more about that? So our, the the Denver Police Department, this is the process, um, and it's sometimes referred to as administrative leave from other agencies, but the officers are not in a line assignment. They're not working in a patrol duty assignment, but we are processing through this reintegration process with our wellness coordinator uh, currently. They don't stagnate or just sit and wait. Um, we're, we're processing them through, helping them lear learn and grow. They're going through different trainings, um, and so that when the time comes in the department and the officer are ready to return to duty, that they can transition smoothly. And um, can, can you talk at all about, you know, obviously this was a situation um, where when the officers made the decision to fire, um, there were two other people very, very close. Um, and one of them was, was you know, right, right next to the man who was ultimately shot. Um, can you just kind of tell me a little bit about that kind of analysis that, that was made by, by the officers, kind of a, I guess, trade-off, if you will? Absolutely. It's, it's uh, as you watch the video, uh, it's very quick. It's chaotic. There's a lot going on. This is a room that they hadn't been in, in introduced to before, so everything is new uh, to them at that point. Uh, they had to make some very quick analysis and decisions regarding that, uh, who, who was the offender, and that was based on um, what they were seeing, the actions of the, of the individual, one holding, seemingly holding a knife to prevent from somebody from being stabbed. You'll see from the video that the officers closed the distance. Uh, the screenshot that I give you is from the outside of the room, but they actually enter that room and close the distance. And when they feel it's safe, um, they, and the, uh, there's sufficient separation between the two subjects, that's when the officers discharge their weapon. They were very intentional not only in the direction of fire, uh, the trajectory, they knew their rounds, they knew their backdrop, and they knew uh, they only fired the number of rounds that were needed to stop the threat that the, uh, of the violence of, of the uh, individual being stabbed. And um, do you know about um, how many officers in total responded to the scene? I mean, between the initial response and then you also mentioned there was um, a, a response from Metro SWAT and even um, EMS. And, are, are you able to talk about kind of how many responders were there in total? I know it was a large. I, Chief, I'm not sure if you know. Uh, I don't know the exact number of officers that were actually on scene. I believe that there were uh, two officers, obviously, that engaged in the force. I believe that there were another three individuals that were inside the home in very close proximity to where the shots were fired. There were a number of other officers on scene uh, providing perimeter security. Uh, I think that our SWAT team had, uh, members of our SWAT team had just barely arrived in order to uh, take over if, if that would have been the case. Um, and then uh, again, we were waiting for our uh, uh, negotiators to arrive as well. Can you address what determines when Metro SWAT takes over a scene versus allowing the officers on site to do Certainly. This? So, you know, so. Um, this was uh, identified as a barricade situation, and so once a barricade situation is declared, um, and there's a an, uh, there's a, a belief that we need some sort of emergency response, we will call um, uh, those officers that are expert in, in doing that kind of response, as well as calling our hostage negotiators or our crisis negotiators that are also expert in conducting those uh, um, actions, um, and then. Uh, you know, the, the reason why we, um, so we will uh, maintain that scene until those officers arrive and then they will switch them out just so that we have people that are, uh, that are uh, more well trained in how to, in how to respond should the, uh, should the need to occur uh, in an emergency. Um, and then again, also having those, uh, those expert hostage negotiators uh, enter the room as well. Is there any doubt that the subject of this incident is the one that escalated? response uh, there's no doubt you know I think w when you look at the body cam video I think that you will hear and see that uh, this individual had escalated you know I think the officers did a fantastic job uh, really trying to de-escalate and try to distract uh, the individual um, and then it became clear to him that they were not effective and that they needed to move quickly in order to stop that imminent threat they did so Am I, um, at one point in the footage I thought I heard um, something about <clears throat> So there, there, there was some conversation about trying to get a hold of another family member, and the officers were uh, making those attempts to do so. I think that's why um, those officers that had uh, that initial contact uh, 
kind of remained in contact because they were actually trying to facilitate some of the uh, demands that this individual had placed. And I'm interested to know more as well about the, the decision not to go into the room right away, like at the very beginning of the, the response mm -hmm. in the situation, um, and to, to go in later um, is, if it looks like it may turn into a, a barricade situation, is it? What, I guess, how is the decision made whether to try and go into the into a room right away or mm -hmm. not? Well, I mean, to, to a certain degree, it's a discretionary decision, but I think that um, also based upon their training, I think that they did not want to create uh, a deadly force encounter uh, if they could if they could prevent that. And so I think that they initially defaulted to maintaining positions of cover, uh, keeping themselves safe, not trying to escalate the situation, trying to de-escalate uh, through voice, uh, which I think they did for a significant period of time. Uh, that ended up no, no longer being successful. And then I think uh, that the suspect's uh, actions, which could be clearly heard, I think uh, necessitated them you know, escalating and, and, and then having to use force. Thank you.